Chapter 84, Chapter 84 Another Peter? Dr. Octopus frowned deeply, his eyes shifting back and forth between Spider-Tom and Mark, filled with confusion. Mark approached Spider-Tom and extended his hand for a friendly handshake. Nice to meet you, Peter. Oh, the whole world now knows who I am. Spider-Tom shrugged in resignation. But who are you? Another Spider-Man? A wild, new Spider-Man? What do you mean by wild? Are you being polite? Mark rolled his eyes. I'm a legitimate, homegrown Spider-Man. But he didn't stop walking and continued toward Dr. Octopus. Dr. Octopus kept watching Mark as he approached, refraining from launching an attack when he came within three or four meters. Do you really not recognize me? Mark asked in confusion. Dr. Octopus removed his sunglasses and looked at Mark, furrowing his brow. Judging by your appearance, I seem to know you? Of course, Otto Octavius, in another world, Mark said, you are even my employee. Dr. Octopus, huh? What nonsense is this guy talking about? But he really knows my name. But his voice doesn't sound like Peter Parker's. What's going on? Spider Tom? Rushed and not entirely trusting of a Spider-Man who associates with this villain, Spider-Tom had a hint of caution toward strangers after the events with Mysterio. Of course, it was just a tiny bit of caution. Otherwise, in the original plot, he wouldn't have shown such kindness, bringing several villains to his safe house and indirectly causing Aunt May's death. So, Spider-Tom interrupted, hold on, you two. Could you please introduce yourselves? Because right now, I'm feeling a bit lost. After re-evaluating, Mark shrugged. From Dr. Octopus's reaction, he had already deduced that this Dr. Octopus had been pulled from a parallel universe within the same movie dimension, not the world he had visited. This was getting interesting. From the feedback of the forces of destiny, Mark could sense that he had indeed altered the fate of the Dr. Octopus from Toby's Spider-Verse. However, since Dr. Octopus himself was not on the web of destiny, he had not received the feedback and, therefore, could not enhance his powers. In Toby's case, whether Dr. Octopus lived or died had a relatively minor impact on his life in the short term, so it didn't provide Mark with much feedback. But destiny couldn't be faked. So, after I changed the official history, did it inexplicably spawn a parallel universe that hasn't had its history altered? Mark wasn't entirely sure whether it was because the main universe Spider-Tom inhabited was so powerful that it forcibly created this parallel world or if it had existed independently. Despite having some control over the forces of destiny, he wasn't a master weaver or an abstract entity like Eternity and Infinity. He was still relatively inexperienced in using the power of destiny, mainly relying on it passively. If you recognize me, and he doesn't, does that mean you're Peter? Dr. Octopus coldly eyed Mark as he pondered, while his mechanical tentacles darted towards him. Spider-Tom rushed over quickly. Although he suspected that this new Spider-Man and the man with mechanical tentacles were working together, the new Spider-Man had just saved someone, so he couldn't stand by idly while he was attacked. However, Spider-Tom was fast, but Mark was faster. Even before gaining enhanced abilities, Mark already had the strength to overpower Dr. Octopus, let alone now. The mechanical tentacles were halfway to their target when they became powerless. Mark reached out and grabbed one of the mechanical tentacles, effortlessly pulling it towards him. Dr. Octopus tried to resist with the other two tentacles, each exerting a force of around eight tons. However, Mark's strength was overwhelming, and there was no resistance. He pulled Dr. Octopus towards him, along with the tentacle, leaving the scientist in a state of panic. Bang! Mark delivered a punch to Dr. Octopus' head and then skillfully used his strength to combine several of the mechanical tentacles, coiling them around him like a bundle of sushis. He added a few strands of webbing to secure the bonds. With that, everything was done. Spider-Tom stood nearby, still in the stance of preparing to charge, 
but he realized the battle had already ended. For a moment, he was left dumbfounded. Is it over just like that? Mark casually tossed Dr. Octopus' bundled package aside and turned to smile. Why not? Must we always go back and forth with our opponents? But, this, Spider Tom was still somewhat incredulous. His past experiences involved prolonged battles, searching for weaknesses, or using taunts to disrupt the enemy's focus before finishing the fight. Exactly, Mark shrugged. Why waste time if you can finish it with one blow? Well, when you put it that way, Spider Tom nodded thoughtfully. But, just to be clear, you're really not working with him? Of course not. How can Spider-Man team up with a villain? Well, at least most Spider-Men wouldn't, Mark replied. He suddenly remembered from his recent readings that in some alternate dimensions, there were Spider-Men who were villains or even more villainous than the villains themselves. For example, in Earth-11638, before becoming the Ghost Spider, the Spider-Man of that world was a maniac who enjoyed conducting experiments on small animals and was a voyeur, often peeping on his neighbor, Sarah Jane, MJ, while she changed clothes. His guardian, Uncle Ben, despised him, and their interactions usually ended with Uncle Ben shouting at him or even physically scolding him. During a field trip to Alchemax, he was bitten by a radioactive spider and gained superhuman abilities, similar to other Spider-Men. However, due to his upbringing and his twisted nature, he didn't become a heroic Spider-Man but rather a monstrous Spider-Man. First, he ate live mice, then he devoured Sarah Jane's cat, and later, he even consumed Uncle Ben. He bullied his classmate, Flash Thompson, and tricked Sarah Jane into coming to his home, attempting to force her to give birth to little spiderlings. In his case, with great power comes great responsibility became with great power comes a bigger appetite. It was a terrifying world. Honestly, when Mark saw these outliers among Spider-Men, he felt fortunate that he hadn't encountered such individuals during his initial traverses. Otherwise, his initial fondness for the Spider-Man identity might have led him astray. Indeed, there are dark sides to being a spider, so traversing between universes requires caution. Degree degree degree. Hungry for more chaps? Then check out our Patreon. Link, patreon.com slash baphometfiction. I post 10 advanced chapters of this fanfic there. Chapter 85, Chapter 85. All right, go rescue the lady in that car over there. Her door's stuck, and she can't get out. Mark pointed towards a nearby car. Spider Tom realized the importance of this situation, as it concerned MJ and Ned's enrollment at MIT. He rushed over and forcefully opened the car door. Ma'am, you're safe for now. You should hurry and leave. You might still make it to your flight, he reassured the woman inside. She looked at Spider Tom with astonishment and said, Peter, you're a hero. Peter, still somewhat unsure of her intentions, was a bit worried that she might reject him because of what she had just witnessed. No, I, he started, but his words trailed off. Mark approached Peter, his suit disassembling as he put his arm around him. As you can see, ma'am, Peter is indeed a hero. Although he's still young, he risked his life in space, battled extraterrestrials, and played a part in preserving this planet and its lives. Such a hero, yet he's treated like this. Do you think that's fair? Peter felt a bit embarrassed by Mark's words and looked down. However, his eyes were slightly upturned, hopeful for the woman's response. The woman beamed a brilliant smile, glancing at Mark and then back at Peter. You're right. Heroes shouldn't be treated this way. I'll do my best to help you and your friends with your plans. Really? Peter raised his head, filled with joy. I including me? Of course, don't you want to go to MIT, the woman teased. Of course, of course. I absolutely want to. It's just. Peter was overwhelmed with excitement. Mark patted Peter's shoulder. All right, now's the time for a thank you, not a rap performance. 
The conversation was lighthearted. With Peter's inherent heroism and Mark's assistance, the woman promised to do everything she could to ensure Peter's enrollment in MIT. Afterward, she hurriedly left to catch her flight. Buzz. Not long after she left, the spider sense tingled again. Clang, clang, clang. Not far away, a spherical object descended from the sky, bounced on the ground a few times, and then exploded. Heh, the green goblin, Mark chuckled. Having watched the original story, he had anticipated the green goblin's arrival here. Instead of wandering around this world, he had followed his spider sense directly to Spider Tom. Do you know him? Spider Tom asked. Of course, I faced two different green goblins, one was another version of him, and the other was his son. Well, maybe the one coming isn't either of those I know, Mark shrugged. The randomness of the multiverse was far greater than he had imagined. Perhaps there were more individuals from the original story who arrived in this world. Uh, your words are a bit confusing, Spider Tom said, somewhat puzzled. He wasn't foolish, in fact, he was quite intelligent. Otherwise, Iron Man wouldn't have treated him like a son or even considered him a replacement. He even heard about the Avengers borrowing Infinity Stones from other timelines during the Infinity War because the Infinity Stones in this world had been destroyed. He had wondered whether these other timelines were other worlds. After encountering Mysterio who claimed to be from another world, with Nick Fury vouching for him, he had briefly believed in the concept of parallel universes. But now, Mark's words made him reconsider all of these things. Forget about that for now. Are you sure you don't want to intervene? Mark pointed upwards. Through the smoke, a figure on a glider was rapidly approaching. All right. Let me handle this, Spider Tom took a deep breath, preparing himself. He wanted to learn from Mark's one-punch takedown technique. But just then, whoosh. A beam of light swept across Spider Tom, Mark, and the incapacitated Dr. Octopus lying nearby. The next moment, Mark found himself inside a massive container. The container was covered on all sides with a peculiar magical substance, preventing anyone from breaking out but allowing them to see and hear what was happening outside. Mark was a bit puzzled, muttering, why did Dr. Strange capture me? However, he didn't rush out, but put one hand on one of the containers. He was still quite curious about the magic used by the Ancient One and Dr. Strange, which was generally considered to be dimensional power, but no one knew what exactly it consisted of. What Mark was curious about was whether that so-called dimensional power was the same as his own quantization. If so, could he also learn some magic to increase his long-range output? Mark skillfully quantized one of his hands and stuck it on the magic barrier. On the other hand, being inexplicably transported into the middle of a dark space had inspired Spider Tom's PTSD. Not long ago, in the battle with Mysterio, he was pitched several times by Mysterio's bizarre and unpredictable virtual reality technology. In the end, it was only thanks to Peter's wit that he was able to turn defeat into victory. He wondered if he was in a similar space. Until Dr. Strange Stephen Strange approached him and explained everything to him. The forgetting magic that failed when he interfered with his mouth, pulling many people from parallel universes into this one. Shocked to learn from Dr. Strange about the huge consequences caused by him, Spider Tom slowly looked around at these cages around him. A very ugly lizard monster. Dr. Octopus who had just fought on the bridge. And another Spider-Man, what was he doing sitting on the floor? Quickly returning to his senses, Spider Tom pointed to Mark and said to Dr. Strange, Mr. Strange, can you let him out? He's Spider-Man too. Dr. Strange shook his head, I think it's best if we don't have too much contact with them, because, frankly, the multiverse is a concept we know very little about. 
Indeed, the concept of the multiverse is one that is very general to you, but one that I have long since grown accustomed to. Mark's voice rang out beside the two of them. Dr. Strange turned his head and stared, how did you get out? Whoa, man, you cracked Mr. Stranger's magic too. Spider Tom's attention span was clear. And what is that, your awesome tone? Is that something to be proud of? Well, a small victory over the Sorcerer Supreme and magic does seem like something to be proud of. Degree, degree, degree. Hungry for more chaps? Then check out our Patreon. Link, patreon.com slash baphometfiction. I post 10 advanced chapters of this fanfic there. Chapter 86, Chapter 86 Dr. Strange gave Spider-Tom a look that said, What do you mean? Spider-Tom immediately raised his hands in surrender. Sorry, Mr. Steven, that's not what I meant. I just think it's really cool to have a Spider-Man who can do magic. Dr. Strange turned to Mark and asked, Are you the Spider-Man from another world? Mark nodded, Of course, isn't it obvious? As the former Sorcerer Supreme, don't you sense my presence? Dr. Strange furrowed his brow, hesitating a bit. I did sense a difference in you in this world before, but it seems to have disappeared now. What kind of existence are you? This was an unprecedented situation for him. He even thought that his perception might have been off. But when he turned to look at Dr. Lizard and Dr. Octopus, he could clearly see the distinct aura emanating from them. So, it wasn't his perception that was off, but there was something wrong with the person in front of him. Dr. Strange stared at Mark intently, his hands already preparing for magic. Mark took a step back. Whoosh! His body instantly appeared in the magical prison. Then, in a flash, he appeared before the two again. As you can see, I am a legitimate dimensional traveler, guided by destiny. Mark put on a mysterious and inscrutable expression. But his revealed ability truly added a touch of mystery and greatly increased the credibility of his words. A legitimate dimensional traveler? Dr. Strange looked at Mark, seemingly hoping to find traces of panic on his face. But it was evident that he failed. Mark's face only showed confidence. He nodded and reaffirmed, My codename is the Spacetime Spider-Man, and I serve destiny. When different timelines or Spider-Men face crises, I follow the guidance of destiny and appear before them. The power of destiny resides within me, so I serve myself and follow my own guidance, shouldn't that be a problem? Mark thought confidently, holding his ground, so even though Dr. Strange continued to scrutinize him and even tested him with magic, he remained unfazed. What kind of crisis will I encounter? Spider Tom asked curiously. Unlike Dr. Strange, who still had doubts, the young Spider Tom quickly accepted Mark's explanation and became curious about what he had to say. In fact, he originally wanted to ask why Mark hadn't appeared during his previous crises, but then he realized that although those situations could be considered crises, he had managed to resolve them without much trouble. Perhaps they weren't significant enough to warrant someone crossing time and space to help him. So, does that mean this crisis is of an unprecedented scale? After imagining the possibilities, Spider Tom's expression turned fearful. You've disrupted Steven's magic, causing rifts between dimensions, Mark explained confidently, sensing that Dr. Strange's probing magic had dissipated. A faint smile played at the corner of his mouth. He knew that he had passed Dr. Strange's test for the most part. Mark continued, these rifts have opened portals to this universe from various parallel universes, bringing forth many supervillains. As far as I know, there are six of them. Whoa! Six! Spider Tom's eyes widened. That's right. The one who looks like a mini version of Godzilla is called the Lizard, his real name is Kurt Connors. You can also call him Dr. Lizard because he's truly a doctor in cross-species genetics. 
It was his own experiment that turned him into this monstrous form. Mark pointed to the lizard doctor in the first magical prison and introduced him. Spider Tom exclaimed in amazement, Thank goodness the spider that bit me didn't turn me into a spider monster. Oh, in many worlds, there are indeed examples of spider men turning into monsters, Mark casually remarked. WTF? Are you serious? Of course. Spider Tom anxiously felt his own body, wearing a worried expression. All right, stop pondering and let's move on to the second person. Mark looked at Dr. Octopus, who was eavesdropping on their conversation, and said, This is Dr. Octopus, full name Otto Octavius, a nuclear physicist. The third person is the one we saw on the bridge earlier, the demon wannabe in green armor. His name is Norman Osborne, also known as the Green Goblin. They both know him and have worked for him, Mark pointed to the lizard doctor and Dr. Octopus. Dr. Strange gave a probing look. Dr. Octopus remained silent, clearly giving his consent. The fourth person is called Electro, real name Max Dillon. He used to be an electrical engineer and also an employee of Osborne Industries. He has the ability to control electricity. Spider Tom finally snapped back to reality. This Osborne Industries is really terrifying, creating so many monsters. Roar! The lizard doctor let out a furious roar, startling Spider Tom. Spider Tom's voice abruptly stopped, and he quickly turned around to apologize Sorry, I was just condemning that Osborne guy. The fifth person is called Sandman, real name William Baker. Just like his codename suggests, he can manipulate sand and even absorb nearby sand to replenish himself when injured. However, he also has a clear weakness, Mark continued to explain. I know! Spider Tom exclaimed, the main component of sand is silicon dioxide, and it melts and even turns into glass at certain high temperatures. Bingo! Mark praised, giving a thumbs up. So, when the time comes, find a way to heat him up, and you can take him down. Uh, are you saying, kill him? Like, kill him? Spider Tom was surprised. Well, how else do you plan to cure him? Mark asked, puzzled. But killing someone seems a bit too much, right? Spider Tom was conflicted. All right, I was just messing with you, Mark laughed. He didn't insist on changing Spider Tom's mindset like he did with Spider Andrew. Spider Andrew was too soft, partly due to his short time with the powers and lack of guidance, so he only realized the consequences after losing them. But Spider Tom had already gone through a lot, and even from an outsider's perspective, his experiences seemed more extensive than Mark's. Moreover, he had Iron Man as his mentor, almost like a father figure. Despite Iron Man's seemingly indifferent attitude towards him, he genuinely cared. For example, adding a tracker to his suit, contacting official authorities after hearing Spider Tom's complaints, and even rushing back from the other side of the earth to clean up Spider Tom's mess, repairing the ferry, and so on. So, Spider Tom should be the most aware and knowledgeable among the three versions of Spider Man. It's just that Mark, having seen the plot, had a clearer understanding of the future development of events, allowing him to provide some advice from an outsider's perspective. And all he needed was just these small suggestions. Degree, degree, degree. Hungry for more chaps? Then check out our Patreon. Link patreon.com slash fiction. I post 10 advanced chapters of this fanfic there. Chapter 87, Chapter 87. Six of them, but what about the seventh? Dr. Strange interjected. He didn't express any opinion regarding Mark's seemingly provocative words, suggesting Spider Tom to commit murder. In reality, he was only concerned with maintaining the stability of the timeline. The last one is an alien, from a parallel universe, named Venom, belonging to the symbiote species. 
It's a rather dangerous creature, Mark said. Dangerous? How dangerous? Spider Tom inquired. He had witnessed Mark's formidable abilities on the bridge and knew that this Spider Man's strength surpassed his own. To have someone like him considered dangerous spoke volumes about the threat level. The symbiotes originate from the Lord of the Abyss. They can attach themselves to any life form and possess a hive consciousness similar to Zerg or some similar stuff, Mark explained. Although he hadn't encountered Venom personally, his connection to Spider Man had led him to study this entity thoroughly. Thus, he had some basic knowledge. Zerg? Are you saying the ones from StarCraft? Spider Tom asked. Mark nodded, yes, the Lord of the Abyss is their queen, and each symbiote is a drone. They once ravaged countless planets until they attempted to invade Earth, only to be stopped by Thor, who severed the connection between the Hive and the Queen. Subsequently, the symbiote species turned the tables and took control and trapped that Elder God, achieving their liberation and wandering aimlessly throughout the universe. They actively seek out living organisms as hosts and, upon bonding with a host, record the host's genes and genetic material in their own genetic code, constantly enhancing themselves. Venom is one of those symbiotes that fell to Earth in a parallel universe. Isn't there any way to prevent them from parasitizing? Spider Tom shuddered at the thought of something worm-like crawling into his body, taking control, and even recording his DNA, among other things. It was chilling. Preventing parasitization is challenging because it can be subtle. Unless you notice it in time and detach it before it leaves a mark on your spine, it will stay attached to you. Moreover, some individuals actively seek out symbiotes, Mark explained. Actively seek them out? Why? Don't they find it strange to have something inside them? In any case, it doesn't sound like a pleasant experience, Spider Tom exclaimed. Because symbiotes, once bonded with a host, provide incredible powers. In every aspect. Enough to turn an ordinary person into a superhuman. You understand, power, Mark stated. Dr. Strange took over the conversation with a grave expression. So, it seems this is the most significant threat. Yes, if left unchecked. We'll soon have a new supervillain on our hands, and a reckless one at that, Mark confirmed, supporting Doctor Strange's suspicion. Wait, what if we use magic to send them back quickly? Spider Tom suggested. Unfortunately, the feasibility of that is quite low, Mark shattered his illusions without mercy. Why? Because symbiotes are fundamentally amorphous four-dimensional beings, time and space don't really have much meaning for them. This is also why they typically seek hosts to survive because they need hosts to anchor themselves in space and time. Mark explained. So, they can disregard the rules between different parallel universes? Dr. Strange said with seriousness in his voice. Yes. This is troublesome, Dr. Strange muttered. He quickly walked over to a table in the room, saying rapidly, So, Peter, wait. What's your name, by the way? He had just realized that he still didn't know Mark's name. Mark replied, I'm Mark. All right, Mark. Since you're familiar with these guys, can I ask you and Peter to bring them all back before they cause more trouble in this world? Dr. Strange earnestly requested. Of course, I can do that, Mark agreed readily. There were quite a few things in this world that he had his eyes on. He would undoubtedly have to visit this world frequently and build a good relationship with Doctor Strange, which could save him a lot of trouble. Moreover, if their relationship was good enough, perhaps he could ask for his help when dealing with the Inheritor's family. Although many people criticized Doctor Strange for being less powerful than the Ancient One, who was hailed as the Supreme Sorcerer, what if he simply didn't want to borrow too much power? When things really hit the fan, he should still be formidable. In the event of a crisis, he would be a powerful ally. Mr. Stephen, are you planning to go out and capture that venom? Mark asked. 
Yes, its danger surpasses that of the other five combined, we must capture it. Doctor Strange asserted firmly. As he said this, Mark could even sense a massive surge of magical energy. Clearly, he was about to take serious action. When the Abyssal Lord Null forged the original symbiote, the all-black Necrosword, he used high temperatures and sound to torture it repeatedly, leaving the symbiote with a fear of sound and high temperatures. You can use this to capture it, Mark quickly explained. Doctor Strange expressed his gratitude, saying, this is very helpful. Thank you for your guidance. With that, he tossed another armband over to Mark. This is a simple magical device that can cast a teleportation spell. It can transport the target to this magical prison no matter where they are. Unfortunately, the situation is urgent, so I only made one. Mark accepted the magical device, which was essentially a wristband with temporary magical runes engraved on it. After examining it briefly, he handed it to Spider Tom. Here, I'll leave this to you. I'll be the primary attacker, and you'll be support. Look for opportunities to capture them. All right. Spider Tom eagerly received the magical wristband, putting it on his wrist and examining it excitedly. Young people always had a high interest in magic. After briefly discussing their plan, Doctor Strange drew a circle in front of him and teleported away. Seeing Doctor Strange leave, Mark breathed a sigh of relief. Even though Venom only existed as an Easter egg in the original work and didn't play a significant role, having experienced several worlds with various alterations, he couldn't be entirely sure this world wouldn't be different. Symbiotes were so dangerous, and he didn't want to inadvertently come into contact with one without any preparation. Degree degree degree. Hungry for more chaps? Then check out our Patreon. Link patreon.com slash fiction. I post 10 advanced chapters of this fanfic there. Chapter 88, Chapter 88 All right, what do we do next? Spider Tom asked honestly, deferring to Mark's opinion, which was tantamount to acknowledging Mark's leadership. After all, Mark had gained Dr. Strange's recognition. And even though he didn't want to admit it, Mark seemed more reliable than him. From this perspective, Spider Tom was still a child at heart, someone who hadn't fully matured, lacked initiative, and always wanted to rely on something or someone. First, let's gather our team, Mark said. Our team? Spider Tom questioned. Mark nodded, first and foremost, your logistical tech support and your brain. You mean Ned and MJ? Spider Tom suddenly understood. Yes, Mark confirmed. In Spider Man Homecoming, Ned used a few ordinary school computers to assist Spider Tom in a reconnaissance mission. Although not perfect, his abilities were quite impressive. As for MJ, her intelligence and bravery matched Mark's earliest impressions of her from the comic book version, not the movie version. Moreover, MJ provided a special buff for Spider Tom. However, Mark's reference to team wasn't limited to just these two. There were also two other spider people from different parallel universes. Mark had gone to see this movie specifically to watch the interactions between the three versions of spider people. Now that he had the chance to meet them in person, he couldn't pass it up. Regarding the origins of these two young spider people, Mark had given up hope. Given that both previous villains had come from different parallel universes, there was a high probability that these two were not from the same universes he had visited. But whether or not he knew these young spider people personally, their identities as spider people were indisputable. So, it was entirely reasonable to bring them here in advance. However, finding the two of them wouldn't be easy, and they would need logistical support. Thinking about this, Mark felt somewhat regretful. He had been so focused on talking about the villains that he had forgotten about this. Doctor Strange was impatient by nature, and upon hearing about Venom, he had immediately set off. Mark now wished he had asked him to open a portal and bring the two young spider people here before leaving. 
Mark had to face the consequences of his decision. He instructed Spider Tom to call Ned and MJ over first and see if they could locate them using Ned's technology. Spider Tom had no doubts about this plan. Mark's ability to bring in his friends for assistance was a recognition of sorts. After bidding them farewell, he left the Sanctum Sanctorum. As Doctor Strange and Spider Tom departed one after the other, the underground chamber became much quieter. Mark turned to Octopus Doctor and Lizard Doctor, who had been eavesdropping on their conversation. A somewhat mischievous idea crossed his mind. What if he went to the parallel universe he had visited before and brought the temporarily reformed Octopus Doctor to this world to meet the other Octopus Doctor? He wondered how that encounter would unfold. Mr. Mark, it seems like you're thinking of something rather impolite, Octopus Doctor observed Mark's expression and furrowed his brow slightly. Oh, no, it's nothing impolite, Mark chuckled and changed the subject. But I am curious, Dr. Octavius, do you remember what happened before you appeared here? Before I appeared here? Octopus Doctor was intrigued by Mark's question and began to think. I remember I was in my makeshift lab, and I had control over the sun's energy again. Then, Spider-Man showed up. I think I should have fallen into the river along with my solar energy, and then... I died? Octopus Doctor's expression shifted from surprise to hesitation as he spoke. Anyone who discovered they should have died would likely have a similar reaction, right? With that in mind, he raised his head, his eyes filled with a hint of supplication. It seemed like he was confirming this fact with Mark, the time-space Spider-Man who possessed the ability to traverse parallel universes, while hoping it was just an illusion. Otherwise, what would he be? A ghost? Unfortunately, Mark nodded without hesitation. You're right. In your world, you indeed died. During your second experiment, the miniature sun went out of control once more and was about to cause a catastrophe. At that moment, you chose to be buried under the sea along with it. Oh, I see, Octopus Doctor's gaze became somewhat vacant. So, am I a ghost now? Ghosts? No, 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 Mark shook his head repeatedly. While there might be spirits, even demons, there are no ghosts. Well, not that I've encountered anything that I've mentioned. What about me? Octopus Doctor's eyes brightened slightly. No one wanted to know they were already dead. Mark explained, for certain reasons, at the very moment before you died, you left that world and came here. So, in a way, the people who just left, the two of them, are responsible for saving your life. Octopus Doctor nodded, lost in thought. Hey, little bug. At this moment, Lizard Doctor, who had been silent, growled softly, catching the attention of both Mark and Octopus Doctor. You know me, which means you've been to a world where I exist? Mark turned to Lizard Doctor and said, Yes, but hasn't anyone taught you manners, Dr. Connors? He he he, manners? What's that? Lizard Doctor chuckled softly, his voice sounding like two stones grinding against each other, rather grating. Did I succeed in that world? Did I establish a great lizard kingdom? Mark sneered. A lizard kingdom? In the next moment, he flashed across more than 10 meters in an instant, even crossing through the magical barrier, appearing inside Lizard Doctor's cell. Lizard Doctor reacted quickly, growling and lunging at him. Mark made a simple move, clenched his fist, and raised it. Bang! A loud noise echoed through the entire underground chamber. The whole place seemed to tremble for a moment. Lizard Doctor was slammed heavily against the top of the cell, and when Mark withdrew his hand, he fell heavily to the ground. Mark placed his foot on Lizard Doctor's head, sneering, the Lizard Doctor from that world was killed by me. If you want to die, I can send you off too. Hey, hey! Calm down, Octopus Doctor, oddly enough, acted as the voice of reason. That wizard who can perform magical feats probably didn't lock us up here just to have us killed, did he? You're also an outsider, killing someone on his turf might not be a good idea. 
Mark applied pressure with his foot, causing Lizard Doctor's skull to creak and gradually crack. Clearly, his skull was being subjected to tremendous force. However, Mark was careful not to kill Lizard Doctor. Even though H's skull was damaged, with Lizard Doctor's regenerative abilities, recovery would be a breeze. Degree 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 Hungry for more chaps? Then check out our Patreon. Link, patreon.com slash baphometfiction. I post 10 advanced chapters of this fanfic there. Chapter 89, Chapter 89. A slash N, I apologize for the late chapter. Degree Degree Degree. Mark couldn't stand Lizard Doctor's attitude. Octopus Doctor was obsessive because he wanted to create an artificial sun, not for privilege but to advance technology and provide unlimited energy to humanity. He believed that his intelligence was a gift from above, meant to serve others and benefit humanity, not to dominate over others. Even though the chip in his mechanical tentacles had made him radical, he didn't abandon this belief. He only became a supervillain because the artificial sun he created had flaws, not because it was his original intention. Lizard Doctor, on the other hand, was different. His initial research on the cross-genetic serum was driven by one thing, money. He had worked alongside Richard Parker, but when Richard discovered that the Osborne Corporation was researching the serum to create monster soldiers for waging war against other countries, he chose to escape. Did Lizard Doctor not know about this? It was clear that he didn't. But he still chose to stay and continue researching the serum. Later, he even attempted to force the serum onto others, turning millions of New Yorkers into lizard creatures. So, Mark had absolutely no fondness for him. However, Mark hadn't intended to kill him. After delivering that punch and stomping on him, he emerged from the magical prison. Lizard Doctor lay on the ground for a while before his body fully restored itself. But this time, he didn't dare to raise his head. After getting up, he cautiously retreated to a corner, curling up into a pitiable and helpless posture. Mark didn't pay any more attention to him. As Octopus Doctor had said, killing someone on Doctor Strange's turf, especially someone already detained, wouldn't be justified. It could easily earn Doctor Strange's disapproval and was not worth the trouble. Octopus Doctor sighed in relief. He had been genuinely worried that Mark might recklessly kill Lizard Doctor. Although the guy looked hideous and nothing like a doctor, they were in this underground cell together, sharing a similar fate. If Lizard Doctor died, Octopus Doctor would also start worrying about his own situation. For now, it seemed they were both safe. After this minor incident, Octopus Doctor and Mark sat in silence on the ground, not saying a word. Mark took the opportunity to assess the underground chamber. He had expected that, being a part of the Sanctum Sanctorum, this underground area might contain some items related to magic. However, after a quick inspection, he was thoroughly disappointed. It was nothing more than a storeroom filled with items that seemed to have been in use for years. Within a short time, he found himself growing bored. Estimating the time, he figured it would be about half an hour until Spider Tom would arrive with his friends. So, Mark found a chair, pulled out his smartphone, expertly connected to the internet, and started browsing YouTube. It was said that Spider Tom had several popular videos on YouTube. Experiencing what it was like to watch Spider Man in the real world was quite novel. Thanks to the recent exposure of Spider Tom's real identity, he had become extremely popular in recent days, even feeling like a global sensation. Mark quickly found a few interesting videos. For instance, there was an interview with Peter Parker and his friends, conducted by the blonde girl Betty, who had a brief romantic involvement with Ned Leeds in Heroic Expedition. The interview covered various aspects of Peter's interests, hobbies, and behavior, offering a multidimensional view of the teenage hero. After watching a few videos, Mark stumbled upon one related to him. The video had a title that read, Shocking. Two Spider-Men spotted battling octopus on New Haven Harbor overpass. 
In the video, there were shaky, distant shots of him and Spider Tom fighting Octopus Doctor on the overpass. The footage was quite far away and shaky, clearly taken by someone who had fled to a safe distance and then stopped to film. Mark couldn't help but feel exasperated. These people seemed fearless, escaping danger only to film a video and share it on their social media. However, the comments on the video were interesting. Some were speculating about the identity of the new Spider-Man. Others thought it was a robot created by Spider-Tom using technology similar to Iron Man's, considering that Mysterio had mentioned Spider-Man's attempt to replace Iron Man, making it plausible for him to possess such technology. There were even people suggesting that Spider-Man could potentially be mass-produced, forming something like a Spider-Man League, and they expressed their interest in joining. In short, there were all sorts of comments, including some negative ones. Mark, however, didn't get upset, he just found it amusing. The sensation of being discussed in a pseudo-news media format was rather strange. What are you watching so happily? Spider-Tom returned to the room with a man and a woman in tow. The man was a chubby Asian guy, about six feet tall in both directions, round and with a perpetual slight pout, giving him a humorous look. He was Peter's close friend, Ned Leeds. The woman, of course, was Spider-Tom's girlfriend, Michelle Jones Watson, known as MJ. Despite her lively appearance, MJ possessed a venomous tongue that could verbally obliterate anyone without hesitation. Wow, are you the Spider-Man from another dimension that Peter talked about? Ned rolled up to Mark, excitedly inspecting him as if hoping to find something fundamentally different about him in this dimension. MJ, on the other hand, regarded Mark with a skeptical look. You're really from another world? During her recent trip to Europe, she had seen through the lies of Mysterio and confirmed that his claims of parallel universes were false. Yet now, here was another person claiming to be from a parallel universe. It was challenging for her not to be suspicious. Of course, you can ask those two if they're from other worlds, Mark gestured towards Octopus Doctor and Lizard Doctor. Lizard Doctor had initially been curious about the newcomer but quickly withdrew when Mark pointed at them. Octopus Doctor gave them a faint look but remained silent. Spider Tom sensed the strange atmosphere and asked, what's going on with them? Mark shrugged. Maybe they're not adjusting well. Let's not worry about them for now. How about we focus on the task at hand? Ned, you're a computer whiz. Put your skills to use, see if you can find any special information online. Pay attention to the outskirts of the city, places with large electrical systems. Electro tends to favor those areas. Degree degree degree. Hungry for more chaps? Then check out our Patreon. Link, patreon.com slash baphometfiction. I post 10 advanced chapters of this fanfic there. Chapter 90, Chapter 90 All right, sir, Ned retrieved a laptop from his bag and began working at a table nearby. His computer seemed to have undergone some modifications, running exceptionally fast. MJ furrowed her brows, somewhat displeased with Mark's direct control of the situation. She was worried that her boyfriend might be deceived again. However, on their way here, Spider-Tom had already shared quite a bit of information about Mark and clarified his identity. She understood the urgency of the situation and chose to suppress her doubts for now, planning to keep a close eye on their interactions in the future. Subsequently, the four of them started their respective tasks. Mark recalled the original plot and outlined a few search directions for them. First, the electric field where Electro was highly likely to appear, as long as the plot didn't deviate. Sandman would also be there, killing two birds with one stone. Second, Aunt May's shelter center, as in the original story, the Green Goblin would temporarily return to being a normal person and visit there. 
Third, the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building, places where the other two spider people like to hang out aimlessly. Spider Tom and the others weren't sure why Mark designated these particular places, but considering his identity as a universal traveler, they chose to trust him temporarily. Hey, everyone, I think I've found something. Ned suddenly exclaimed, there's a commotion at a military research center in the suburbs, and witnesses saw a monster flying into the sky. Is that the same green goblin we saw on the bridge? Spider Tom turned to Mark for confirmation. Mark glanced at the blurry image on the video and nodded, it's him, but unfortunately, this image isn't much use. It's been too long, and he's long gone. Octopus Doctor's voice suddenly rang out, I've been thinking, and it still seems unbelievable. All eyes turned to him. Octopus Doctor continued to gaze at Mark, according to what you said, I was pulled into this world by that wizard's magic just before my death. But in my world, Norman Osborn had indeed died. His son found his body in his house, and I even attended his funeral. Did he somehow resurrect, or does he come from a time when he hasn't died yet? Lizard Doctor cautiously added, in my world, Norman Osborn died from a hereditary disease cell proliferation syndrome, and he never became the Green Goblin as you described. However, I heard that his son later turned into something strange. So, he doesn't come from my world either. Mark smiled faintly, I appreciate your inquisitive spirit, and I'm glad you've joined our discussion. But have think of the possibility that he comes from a parallel world that closely resembles Otto Octavius's world? Are you saying? Octopus Doctor's expression froze, as he hadn't considered this possibility. Mark explained, in fact, I've been to your world, and in that world, your ultimate fate wasn't death. Oh? Octopus Doctor's interest was piqued. He had heard Mark mention that he was his employee before. He initially thought it was just a fabricated story, but now it seemed there was more to it. Spider Tom and the other two were immediately intrigued as well. Ned gazed at Mark with admiration, wishing he could embark on such a marvelous adventure. Your solar technology had a fatal flaw, and after I informed you of this flaw, we reached a cooperation agreement. You, me, Harry Osborne, and the Peter Parker from that world together established a transdimensional tech company, Mark explained, watching Octopus Doctor's enthusiasm grow. He couldn't help but smirk slightly. Just a moment ago, he had another idea. Considering that this octopus doctor would likely die once he returned to his world, why not just bring him to Toby's spider world? In that case, two octopus doctors together would not only double the fun but also potentially double the research efficiency. As for following the original plot to treat them? Treatment was still necessary, but not for all of them. For those who remained stubborn, they could be sent back directly. Whatever happened in their original destinies would stand. For those who showed remorse and could be of use, they would be saved and incorporated into this transdimensional tech company. As for concerns about disrupting the timeline, based on his experiences from previous time travels, it wasn't an issue for him as a legitimate dimensional traveler. Dr. Strange had also confirmed this after his consultation. Spider-Tom suddenly realized the significance. No wonder Mark had referred to Octopus Doctor as his employee when they first met. Wait a minute. I found something here. MJ suddenly exclaimed, placing her phone on the table, and the four of them gathered around to take a look. The scene appeared to be on a highway. In the middle of a vast expanse of wilderness, far in the distance, there were several power lines. However, some of these power lines seem to be emitting smoke. This is a substation in the southern outskirts, supplying power to a large part of Brooklyn. Do you see these pictures with smoke? Does it look like an overload of electricity? MJ explained the reason she had noticed it. Spider Tom nodded, very likely. Absorbing electricity is electro specialty, isn't it? Saying this, he looked at Mark, seeking his opinion. Mark pressed his chest, already wearing his nanometal suit. 
No need to doubt, it's him. And Sandman is likely nearby too. Peter, let's go. Mark exclaimed. All right. Spider Tom quickly put on his iron spider suit. Since the battle on the bridge had been resolved by Mark, his iron spider suit wasn't damaged like it was in the original plot. Let's establish communication first, Mark said as he walked to Spider Tom's side, revealing the communicator on his web shooter. This communicator was created by the deceased Spider Man from the Ultimate Universe and had cutting edge technology. It could tap into nearby city shortwave communications, intercept police broadcasts, allowing for quick responses to crime scenes. Spider Tom's Iron Spider Suit also had an integrated communication system. After setting up an encrypted channel, they brought MJ and Ned into it, enabling wireless radio communication within a certain range. With their preparations complete, the two of them left the VIP club and followed the route previously planned by Ned and MJ, heading toward the large substation in the southern outskirts of the city. As they swung through the city using their webs, Holland Spider-Man, unable to withstand the silence, started asking questions. By the way, you didn't say why you wanted to confirm my aunt's workplace. Is there something wrong there? Degree degree degree. Hungry for more chaps? Then check out our Patreon. Link, patreon.com slash baphometfiction. I post 10 advanced chapters of this fanfic there. Chapter 91, Chapter 91 Green Goblin we saw on the bridge earlier might go there to look for her, Mark said casually. What? Spider Tom abruptly halted on the side of a building, staring at Mark in disbelief. Why didn't you tell me this earlier? Mark sighed, first, it's just a possibility. Second, if the Green Goblin seeks out your aunt for help, it means he has calmed down and is no longer the Green Goblin, temporarily. What do you mean? Spider Tom asked in confusion. Mark explained, the Green Goblin was originally a successful businessman, the founder of the Osborne Corporation, as I mentioned earlier. Later, he injected something like a super soldier serum into himself, transforming into a super soldier while also developing a pathological and destructive alter ego in his mind. Wow! Isn't that like the Hulk? Ned suddenly chimed in. On the other side, MJ and Ned could also hear their conversation. Mark corrected, it's different from the Hulk. The Hulk had a childlike temperament when he first emerged, but as he merged with Dr. Banner, he gradually grew up and became controllable, a true superhero. Spider Tom nodded in agreement. Although he hadn't fought alongside the Hulk much, he admired the superhero greatly. Plus, Iron Man had high praise for the Hulk, even developing Hulkbuster armor. But the Green Goblin is different, he's a born criminal with an endless desire for destruction in his mind. You can't reason with him, Mark continued. He wasn't exaggerating. In the original plot, the Green Goblin was the first to turn against the heroes, even using his words to manipulate Electro, the one most easily swayed. Furthermore, Mark had always had another idea. He believed that the birth of the Green Goblin and the Green Goblin Jr. wasn't as simple as the emergence of a second personality. It was more like a mental illness within the Osborne family itself, fused with certain components of the Green Goblin serum, which amplified this character flaw and turned him into a complete madman. So, instead of saying that the suddenly appearing Norman Osborn was the original, it was more accurate to say that he was the alter ego. The Green Goblin had firmly taken over that body when Norman Osborn had drunk the serum, becoming the dominant personality. Such an existence was no longer just influenced. Mental illness, especially of this antisocial type, is untreatable. So, for other villains, even Dr. Connors, Mark had considered the idea of treating and recruiting them for his own purposes. But not for the Green Goblin. This guy is a ticking time bomb, way too dangerous. The best way to handle him is to eliminate him directly to prevent harm to others. 
So, you mean the Green Goblin might temporarily return to normal and then go to see my aunt? Spider Tom slightly breathed a sigh of relief and asked. Mark nodded and confirmed, yes, if he actively seeks help, it's a clear sign of returning to normal. So, your aunt should be safe for the time being. And if he doesn't return to normal, he won't go to see your aunt either, so she'll be safe as well. Spider Tom relaxed completely upon hearing this. That's good, then. They continued on their way. What about the other two places? The Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building? Dr. Connors and Dr. Octopus have already been captured. Electro and Sandman are likely to be at the place you're about to go to. The Green Goblin is missing, but he might appear near the rescue center. Is there anything that would appear in these two locations? MJ wondered. While she spoke, Ned successfully hacked into the street cameras near these two buildings and began quickly reviewing the surveillance footage. Unfortunately, there were few cameras, and they didn't capture much. It was better than nothing, though. Mark grinned, those are places the Spider-Men from the other two worlds like to go. What? How is that possible? Oh my, there are still two other Spider-Men? Spider-Tom, MJ, and Ned all exclaimed in surprise. Spider-Tom spoke seriously, why don't we find them first and then go after the villains together? Mark sighed, I'd like to make it easier too, but Doctor Strange left too quickly and forgot to send them over first. All right, Spider-Tom sighed in resignation. The two of them had no choice but to continue on their way. However, knowing that there were two more Spider-Men out there only increased the enthusiasm of Ned and MJ, especially Ned. He had a lot of questions he wanted to ask, but he was too busy now and didn't want to interrupt. He decided to wait until all four Spider-Men were together to ask everything at once. The southern outskirts weren't too far, and Mark and Spider-Tom were traveling in a straight line through the air. Without traffic to contend with, they were making good time. However, along the way, they had already noticed some clues. For example, the closer they got, the more power outages they encountered. This corroborated the Electro's location because it matched the scenes where the Electrico absorbed electricity. Soon, they left the city behind, leaving the skyscrapers in the distance. In the wilderness, a series of electrical towers appeared before them. Mark looked at this familiar scene, and a smile tugged at the corner of his mouth. This is it. He jumped onto the canopy of a tree and squinted into the distance. Soon, he spotted a humanoid figure in vivid blue among the many electrical towers. He was suspended between two electrical towers, and bolts of lightning shot out from him, connecting him to the towers on both sides. It was evident that he was absorbing the electricity from these towers. Look over there, Mark pointed at the Electrico. Oh my god. I see it. Spider-Tom exclaimed, watching the figure suspended between the electrical towers in awe. Is that the Electrico? Ned and MJ also stopped their search for the other Spider-Men and focused on observing the scene, mostly through a phone attached to Spider-Tom's chest, which was quite amusing. Yes, this guy's weakness is water and he needs to recharge, Mark prepared for the battle. To be honest, he was a bit nervous. The villains he had dealt with before, like the ultimate Green Goblin, Sandman, Dr. Octopus, and the Lizard, were all physical attackers. But the Electric Man, he was a bona fide Logiotype Devil Fruit user with control over lightning. And he didn't have the Gum Gum Fruit powers or hockey. To deal with such an intangible opponent, he needed to find a way to exploit his weaknesses. Water? Spider-Tom looked at his surroundings with a troubled expression. Apart from the forest, there was only dry soil around. Where would they get water? If necessary, we can cut the power lines. Cutting off the electricity is the most direct way, Mark suggested. Spider-Tom nodded. Although cutting the power lines would cause a widespread blackout, it was the optimal choice to subdue this monster and minimize collateral damage. Alright, you draw his attention later, 
I'll try to find his other weaknesses. Let's go. Degree degree degree. Hungry for more chaps? Then check out our Patreon. Link, patreon.com slash baphometfiction. I post 10 advanced chapters of this fanfic there. Chapter 92, Chapter 92. The two quickly spread out, one to the left and the other to the right, converging on Electro. Oh. This guy looks quite shocking. Spider Tom lifted the magic wristband that Doctor Strange had given him and fired a shot at Electro, hoping to use the magical device to teleport this obviously tricky Electro directly to the magical prison. But unfortunately, at this moment, Electro was in a completely ionized state, without a physical form. The transmission magic he shot out passed through Electro's body, arcing through the air and hitting a large tree not far away. Crack! This unfortunate tree had the worst luck, it grew here, mined in its own business, but encountered Spider Tom, who sent it straight to the magical prison beneath the Sanctum Sanctorum. MJ, Ned, Dr. Octopus, and the lizard were all startled. Dr. Octopus asked, puzzled, is this a tree person? From which universe? The lizard grinned, revealing a mouthful of fangs, this mutation is quite novel, a creative idea. No, no, it's just a tree, MJ said, feeling a bit embarrassed about her boyfriend's mistake. Ah, uh, the lizard hesitated for a moment, thinking he had found a kindred spirit. Dr. Octopus also smiled awkwardly. The scene returned to the battle with the Electro. After Spider Tom's initial attack failed to affect the Electro, it alerted him while he was absorbing electricity. His eyes lit up suddenly, and he instantly spotted Spider Tom's position. He raised his hand and sent a high voltage electric current towards Spider Tom. Spider Tom quickly dodged but the high-voltage electric current struck the ground beneath him like thunder, creating a large crater. Seeing his first attack miss, Electro lifted his hand again and fired another high-voltage electric current towards Spider Tom. Spider Tom dared not stay in one place and swiftly maneuvered to the side. Boom! 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 One high-voltage electric current after another struck the ground and the trees below, either creating large craters or setting trees on fire, showcasing Electro's destructive power. At this moment, Mark had quietly approached Electro. His eyes turned into a starry sky as he entered a quantum state. Quantum Insight Originally, this move required direct contact to observe the quantum changes within the target. However, after receiving enhancements from the Master Weaver, which strengthened his powers from all directions, he gained the ability to use Quantum Insight to observe targets within a certain range without direct contact. Now, he was using this ability to observe the energy flow between the electrical towers and Electro. If he could find the point where he channeled the electricity into his body, they could defeat him in one blow. On the other side, Spider Tom had been continuously chased by high voltage electric currents, causing the nearby forest and ground to become a mess. He found it strange that Mark hadn't taken action yet, but he didn't dare to rush him. He knew Mark must have his reasons. If necessary, they had the backup plan of disconnecting the power lines. Suddenly, it seemed like Electro had gotten smarter. He raised his hand abruptly and the next high-voltage electric current appeared in the direction Spider Tom was heading. Although Peter's quick thinking gave him enough feedback, at this moment, he had just jumped to avoid the previous attack, and there was no way he could turn in time. In a critical moment, he could only shoot out a strand of web to twist his body slightly to the side. Boom! The high-voltage current hit Spider Tom, and the violent electricity spread across his body instantly. Boom! Spider Tom grunted, and his whole body was thrown out, lying motionless on the ground. Peter? MJ and Ned, who were in the Sanctum Sanctorum's underground chamber, became extremely worried. Ned couldn't help but call out to Mark, Hey, Mr. Mark, it seems Peter is injured, where are you? Mark couldn't afford to respond to him. 
He was concentrating on observing the energy flow within Electro's body, and he had made some progress. Just as Electro raised his hands, preparing to deliver a devastating blow to Spider Tom, Mark took action. Found it. In Mark's quantum insight view, there were countless energy channels within Electro's body. Among these energy channels, several were particularly robust. For instance, there was one extending from each of his hands, leading to his heart. This might also be why Electro often uses his hands to absorb and release electricity. Quantum scalpel. Quantum blink. Mark's hands suddenly entered a quantum state in midair and, in the next moment, appeared directly behind Electro. Swish. The quantumized hands were like sharp surgical knives, piercing straight into Electro's shoulders on both sides. The two thickest energy channels within Electro's body were directly destroyed. Ah! Electro, who was usually immune to physical harm, suddenly let out a miserable scream. What was even more surprising was that at the injured points on his shoulders, sparks of electricity burst forth, as if a person's body was spraying blood when injured. Who are you? What is this? Electro struggled to turn his head around, but he dared not move rashly. He felt intense fear. Ever since he had become the embodiment of electricity due to an accident, he hadn't felt the word pain for a long time. But at this moment, the person behind him was forcefully making him recall that sensation. For a moment, Electro even forgot to transform into an electric current and just allowed Mark's hands to remain inserted into his shoulders. Max Dillon, actually, I don't really dislike you. I know that your evil actions weren't your intention. You just wanted to get attention from others, right? Mark said. And then no, you understand me? Who are you? Electro was both afraid and touched. This was the first time he had met someone who understood him. If it weren't for the current situation, he would have happily given the person a big hug and invited them for a drink. I am the space-time Spider-Man, appearing to change the tragic fate of those in different timelines. Mark replied. Changing tragic fates? Timelines? Electro was stunned. At this moment, he seemed to forget the pain, forget to continue absorbing energy, and even ignored his own changes. His entire body and mind were captivated by these words. And at this moment, Mark had already released his hands. Degree, degree, degree. Hungry for more chaps? Then check out our Patreon. Link, patreon.com slash baphometfiction. I post 10 advanced chapters of this fanfic there. Chapter 93, Chapter 93 Mark held Electro by the neck and landed on the ground. At this moment, Electro had already reverted to his human appearance, but because the electricity he had absorbed had not completely dissipated, his body faintly shimmered with traces of electricity. After placing Electro on the ground, Mark sighed with relief. His brief ability to hover was not due to gaining the power of flight but rather the result of his self-quantization. In this state, as long as he didn't use his time and space abilities, he wouldn't naturally traverse through time and space. However, maintaining complete self-quantization still required a considerable amount of energy. So, despite the fact that he had only been hovering and talking to Electro for less than a minute, the actual energy expenditure was enough to sustain him in a battle against several supervillains for several tens of minutes. Moreover, this kind of short-term massive energy consumption was more exhausting than a prolonged battle. Fortunately, his efforts were not in vain. Judging from Electro's current condition, the probability of subduing him was quite high. In reality, Electro was a pitiable individual. Unlike the comic book version, who was selfish, greedy, and filled with destructive tendencies, the movie version was just a cog in the Oscorp machine. He was unremarkable in appearance, even somewhat ugly. 
Despite designing a beautiful electrical diagram, it was stolen by his superior. Due to his position, he couldn't speak out. This was the tragedy of a small employee in the corporate world. Being a nobody, he had no friends, and no one even remembered his name, so he yearned for recognition from others. Harry Osborne could easily manipulate him into becoming his enforcer, exploiting Electro's vulnerability. At this moment, Mark was also taking advantage of this aspect. However, unlike Harry Osborne, who only wanted to use him for personal gain, Mark genuinely sympathized with Max and believed that he could be of help. He provided Electro with what he needed, and in return, Electro gave him what he needed. A mutually beneficial relationship. This was the beginning of friendship. Perhaps the starting point wasn't entirely pure, but in the world, truly selfless friendships, untouched by self-interest, were exceedingly rare. They probably only existed when everyone was still children. What happened to him? Spider Tom, who seemed to have sprung up from nowhere, approached Mark quietly and asked. Mark shrugged and replied, I'm not entirely sure. Let's give him some time to recover. By the way, I just encountered someone over there. A person? He seems to be from another world, probably the Sandman you mentioned, Spider Tom pointed to the other side. Mark raised an eyebrow. He had been wondering why Sandman hadn't appeared earlier, and he was a bit concerned that they had resolved the battle too quickly, causing Sandman to miss his chance to intervene. But now, Sandman had shown up. Where is he, and why isn't he coming over? Mark asked in confusion. Spider Tom shrugged and said, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe the scene where you inserted your hands into Electro's body and then brought him down to the ground scared him off? Mark turned to look at Electro. Upon closer inspection, he realized that the sequence of events did make it seem like he had taken out Electro directly. No wonder Sandman was scared. But this was awkward. Originally, Mark had thought that Flint Marco, the Sandman, was one of the few normal individuals among these supervillains and would be the easiest to communicate with. For those who've seen the movie, they know that Sandman robbed banks to afford medical treatment for his daughter. Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man even forgave him because he was just too nervous and shot his uncle by accident. So Mark had no reason to pursue him further. Moreover, Sandman's abilities were useful, making him a potential recruit. So he hadn't paid much attention to Sandman at first, thinking that with some kind words and mentioning the opportunity to help cure his daughter's illness in exchange for cooperation, Sandman would be on his side. Who would have thought that due to a series of misunderstandings, Sandman would be scared away because Mark seemed to have taken out Electro too decisively? This, Mark sighed. Finding Sandman wouldn't be easy. In the city, it would have been as simple as looking for flying sand. But New York is surrounded by three sides of the sea, with a considerable coastline and plenty of beaches, not to mention areas intentionally left as woodlands for specific purposes. There are too many places for Sandman to hide. Unless he shows himself voluntarily, it's challenging to find him. But given the circumstances, even if it's awkward, there's not much that can be done. Fortunately, there's still Electro as a backup plan. After exchanging a few words with Spider Tom, Mark walked back to Electro's side. By now, Max had recovered from his dazed state. The main reason he was in that state was not only due to Mark's words but also because Mark had abruptly cut off the energy flow within him, causing electrical disruptions and a sort of short circuit in his brain. Hearing Mark's footsteps, Electro lifted his head and looked at him. Mark removed his nanotech suit, revealing his youthful face. He wore a sunny smile and extended his hand towards Electro. I'm Mark, Max, feeling better? Can you stand up? The lights from the electric tower illuminated the scene. From Electro's perspective, it was as if he were looking at an angel of God, something sacred, warm, and enlightening. It illuminated his long darkened heart. Ah! 
Max instinctively raised his hand but then quickly withdrew it. My hands are too dirty, I can't. Mark, however, bent down and lightning fast reached out, gripping the hand Max had withdrawn, gently pulling him up from the ground. We're friends, and friends don't have to worry about such things. Friends, Max repeated the unfamiliar word softly, then broke into a wide smile. You're right, we are friends. Thank you, Mark, my friend. You're naked now, but there are some clothes over there, Mark pointed to a nearby box beneath the electric tower. The box contained a few specialized electricians' uniforms, likely used by maintenance workers for repairing circuits in this area. Considering the trouble they had caused and to ensure their electrical reserves weren't entirely stolen, was borrowing a piece of clothing really excessive? Mark used a strand of webbing to retrieve a set and handed it to Max. Max took the electrician's outfit and quickly put it on. After dressing, he walked up to Mark and showed it off. How do I look, my friend? Not bad, it fits quite well. A small smile appeared on Max's dark face, and he scratched his head. He he. Chapter 94, Chapter 94 Spider Tom watched this scene with great interest. Although he didn't understand why Electo, who had been fighting him just a moment ago, suddenly became so friendly with Mark, the idea of turning enemies into friends was something he could get behind. If all the visitors from other dimensions were this easy to talk to, it would be fantastic. But he also knew that such thinking was wishful at best. Think about Dr. Octopus, who wanted to beat him up the moment they met. Think about that green goblin who threw grenades at him upon their first encounter, not to mention attacking military bases and probably making off with a bunch of weapons. Clearly, he was dealing with some restless individuals. To resolve such a significant threat so peacefully was already a satisfying outcome. Shall we head back to the Sanctum Sanctorum? Mark, after chatting with Max for a while, walked over to Spider Tom. All right, Spider Tom asked, what about Sandman? Mark rubbed his temples. Sandman is unpredictable, but he's a good person at heart, without any destructive desires. Let's leave him for now. Once Doctor Strange returns and reverses the magic, we can send him back to his own dimension. Spider Tom also thought that Mark's suggestion made sense. In that case, let's go back together, Max. Can you keep up with us? Max didn't have a friendly expression for Spider Tom, who had attacked him out of nowhere, but considering how familiar he was with Mark and following the principle of a friend of a friend is a friend, his attitude improved slightly. He nodded confidently. Of course, my energy is beyond your imagination. Then let's go, Peter, Max, Mark said, putting his suit back on and leading the way towards the city. Spider Tom followed closely behind. Max had a unique way of flying. He turned himself into a streak of lightning in human form, still wearing the electrician's outfit, and flew up to Mark's side. The specially designed electrician's uniform was quite suitable for Max. It was made of insulating materials capable of withstanding extremely high voltages without damage. If it were regular clothing, it would have turned to ashes when Max entered his electrical state, just like the clothes he initially wore. Max flew casually next to Mark and asked, Where are we going now? To the Sanctum Sanctorum, Mark replied. I feel like something's different here, very unfamiliar. I think we should be cautious, Max continued. Mark smiled, indeed, it's different because we're now in another world, a parallel universe. A parallel universe? Max was surprised. No wonder I feel the electricity here is different, higher voltage and more, vibrant. That's because you haven't seen the better things, Mark said. Better things? Max's eyes lit up. What are they? Mark said, in another world, I have a friend working on developing a miniaturized nuclear fusion reactor. Once the research is successful, we can install one for you, and you won't need to rely on absorbing external electricity to stay active. 
A miniaturized nuclear fusion reactor? Is it very powerful? Max asked, puzzled. Spider-Tom chimed in, it's huge, extremely massive. One nuclear fusion reactor can supply the electricity needs of an entire city. Max was delighted. That's fantastic. With that, I can help you even better. Ha ah, ha, then I'll be looking forward to it. Mark laughed. Meanwhile, across the ocean, in a small tavern in the kingdom of Thailand. A scruffy-looking man with a full beard sat at the bar. In front of him were several empty glasses, and there were several sheets of paper covered in writing nearby. Okay, I think I've got it now. You're saying the whole world is filled with people with superpowers, the bearded man put down his pen, finding the information he just received still somewhat unbelievable. He's been talking about this for hours, a voice echoed in his mind. All right, can you say it one more time? Sorry, because I'm actually a bit of a blockhead, the bearded man looked earnestly at the bartender. There's a billionaire flying around in a tech suit, right? The bartender nodded helplessly. This guy had been asking these questions repeatedly since he showed up here several hours ago. Couldn't he just search the internet? Where did this country bumpkin come from? Could he really afford to pay the bill? The bearded man didn't care about that. He continued, and there's an angry green guy? Hulk, the bartender replied. Hulk, ha, huh, who would name someone that? The bearded man burst into laughter. You think the name Lethal Protector is bad? The voice in his mind chimed in again, clearly irritated. There are even worse names, and people not only use them but also proudly announce them. You idiot! Yeah, but that name really is bad, the bearded man retorted. Then he turned to the bartender and asked, say it one more time, that purple alien who loves stones. From what I know, aliens don't like rocks. Eddie, the rude voice in his mind grew impatient. No, no, don't be upset, Eddie mumbled to himself. Nobody knows aliens better than I do. Aliens' favorite snack is brains. The bartender looked at him as if he were an idiot. They're all like this, you know. Eddie slammed the table. Not exactly, a voice replied. Suddenly, a golden circle appeared on the floor of the bar, and a man in a red cape walked out of it. Finally found you, Venom. The newcomer was none other than Dr. Strange, Stephen Strange. Having received information from Mark, he quickly activated his magic, searching through various corners of the world and finally locating the presence of Venom here. Ah, uh, quite a dramatic entrance. What are you, exactly? Eddie turned to look at Dr. Strange, puzzled. The Venom symbiote shouted in Eddie's mind, you idiot. What question is that? Dr. Strange's face darkened. Visitor from another realm, since you can communicate, come with me to the Sanctum Sanctorum. Once I've set up the return program, I'll send you back to your own timeline. He says he wants to send us back? No, I don't want to go back. Eddie hadn't even spoken yet when the Venom symbiote voiced its objection. Eddie scolded, shut up. Whether we go back or not is up to me. You should be the one to shut up. I have the final say. The Venom symbiote countered. So, in front of Doctor Strange, they began to argue back and forth, one word at a time. Of course, because the Venom symbiote's voice was in Eddie's head, from Doctor Strange and the bartender's perspective, Eddie appeared to be a lunatic, muttering to himself and arguing with himself. The bartender looked at Dr. Strange, hoping this mysterious wizard would take this lunatic away and stop polluting his mind. Chapter 95, Chapter 95 Dr. Strange seemed to hear the bartender's thoughts. With a wave of his hand, two teleportation portals appeared. However, Venom sensed danger at this moment. With a roar, it forcefully took control of Eddie's body, merging with him to become the true Venom. They crashed through the bar's wall and escaped. 
Doctor Strange immediately chased after them. Wait! You haven't paid yet! The bartender's angry voice echoed in the bar. Oh! Sir, I'm grateful for your help. Although skipping out on the bill isn't what Honest Eddie should do, you're the one responsible for all this, not me, Eddie shouted loudly as he ran, occasionally looking back at Doctor Strange. A black line appeared on Doctor Strange's head. He thought this guy suddenly wanted to thank him for something, but it turns out he was blaming Doctor Strange for skipping out on the bill. If you want to thank me, come with me, Doctor Strange said. He extended his hand, and a teleportation portal appeared in front of Venom. Oh no! Venom suddenly changed direction, darting past the portal's side. He looked suspicious. What on earth is this thing? Magic? That's right, it's magic. Doctor Strange swung his right hand, creating a beam of light that shot towards Venom. Weird powers. There's actually magic in this world? This place is more complicated than I thought. Venom grinned. He had no intention of fighting and continued running forward. However, Doctor Strange had numerous tricks up his sleeve, and Venom couldn't get far. He was constantly pulled back to the same spot by Doctor Strange. But for a moment, Doctor Strange couldn't do much against Venom. The symbiote appeared large but surprisingly agile. Moreover, Doctor Strange had just attempted to separate Venom from Eddie's body, only to fail. It seemed like this guy didn't have a soul. How was that possible? At this moment, Doctor Strange truly understood the meaning behind what Mark had called tricky. However, Doctor Strange was not without the means to subdue Venom. He extended both hands and drew magical runes in the air. In his right hand, a whip of flames formed, tracing a circle around the area, directly enclosing it. Then, the whip of flames transformed into a towering wall of fire, blazing fiercely. Ah ah ah! Venom let out a terrified howl. Fire was his weakness. Deep fear almost made him shrink back. At the critical moment, Eddie regained control of his body. He attempted to break through the wall of fire and escape. However, realizing the intense heat of the flames, he looked up at the sky. It's about a dozen meters, it should be doable. Eddie estimated the distance in his mind, checked his own condition, and then made a desperate leap. But at that moment, the circular light from Dr. Strange's left hand flew into the sky, appearing directly in front of Venom, blocking their way. The circular light instantly split into dozens of pieces, spinning rapidly. As they rubbed against each other, they produced an extremely harsh noise. Ah! Roar! Venom crashed heavily to the ground, and the voices of both Eddie and the Venom symbiote sounded together. Seeing this scene, Doctor Strange breathed a sigh of relief. It was fortunate that Mark had informed him of Venom's weakness ahead of time. Combined with this guy's overconfidence, otherwise, dealing with him could have been quite tricky. Doctor Strange performed a teleportation spell, transferring Venom to the underground chamber of the Sanctum Sanctorum. Oh? Mr. Strange is back too? As a glowing portal appeared, Mark, Spider-Tom, and Max had just returned to the underground chamber of the Sanctum Sanctorum. Doctor Strange stepped out of the portal, looking somewhat exhausted. Mark was curious. Did you find Venom? Doctor Strange pointed to the magical prison in the corner. Found him, surprisingly easy. Because he knew Venom's weakness, the battle didn't take too long. However, the search had consumed a great deal of his energy. In a short time, he had opened so many portals and searched almost the entire world, checking everyone named Eddie Brock. The magnitude of the task was enormous. Right now, he just wanted to rest. But he forced himself to stay alert and asked, How about your side? What's the situation? Mark gestured towards Max behind him. We initially found two of them, but unfortunately, one got away. 
The good news is, Max here will join us in the search. Dr. Strange glanced at Max, nodded without much expression, likely trusting in Mark's abilities. Mark walked over to the man lying on the ground in the darkest corner of the underground chamber. Is this Venom? Unfortunately, Mark couldn't see his face, so he couldn't confirm whether this was the version of Venom from Toby's Spider-Verse or the one he had seen a bit of in Venom, let there be carnage. These two versions were quite different and represented entirely different meanings. The former was a pure antagonist, and in that world, Eddie Brock held a deep grudge against Spider-Man, positioning him firmly as an antagonist. The latter, however, could be considered an anti-hero. An anti-hero is a character who has the qualities of a protagonist but also exhibits the flaws of an antagonist. They don't shine as brightly as traditional heroes and aren't universally praised, but they have their own set of moral standards. At times, they are heroes, while at other times, they are despised and even considered villains. Representative examples include Deadpool, certain versions of Venom, Catwoman, DC's Red Hood, and more. Compared to traditional heroes, they are more relatable, more in tune with human complexity. But if it's the latter, it raises a serious question. Because Venom from Venom, Let There Be Carnage, comes from another independent universe. This indicates that, apart from the original Spider-Verse with Toby and Andrew, there's a third parallel universe affected by this event. Could there be a fourth, fifth, or even more? Hey! Are you Eddie Brock? Mark squatted in front of the magical prison barrier and knocked on it. What's your girlfriend's name? Gwen or Anne? Damn it! Who the hell are you, blabbering endlessly? I'm gonna tear your mouth apart. Eddie Brock cursed as he got up from the ground and looked at Mark. Then he glanced around. Where am I? Mark kindly introduced, you're in the magical dungeon of the greatest sorcerer in this world. Impressed? Eddie Brock rolled his eyes. The greatest sorcerer in the world? You must think highly of me. Should I thank him? No need for thanks, he's not here right now, Mark turned to look, not seeing Doctor Strange around, figuring he had gone to rest. Then he turned back to Eddie in the cell. You haven't answered my question yet. What's your girlfriend's name? Eddie Brock walked around the magical prison barrier, seemingly observing if there was any escape route. He looked puzzled at Mark. Why do you care so much about my girlfriend? Do you have some special fascination with other people's girlfriends? Let me disappoint you, I don't have a girlfriend. None. Mark selectively ignored Eddie's profanity. At this age and still no girlfriend? That didn't quite fit the norm, ain't it? What about your ex-girlfriend? Mark continued to ask. Bam! Eddie Brock suddenly rushed up to Mark, punching the magical barrier. What the heck are you trying to do? After bothering about my girlfriend, now you're curious about my ex-girlfriend? I'm gonna beat you to a pulp today. Mark, dot. Some awkward looks were cast from behind. Mark turned his head and found that Spider-Tom had discreetly moved MJ slightly behind him. What the heck? Mark had a twitch on his forehead. I just wanted to confirm if you're from the world I know. Okay, okay, my bad. Let me rephrase it. Do you know Venom, Lethal Protector? Eddie began to reply, why do you? Ha ha ha. See, I told you someone likes that name. A dark head emerged from Eddie Brock's neck, abruptly interrupting Eddie's words. Venom. Mark's expression froze. However, after seeing the appearance of this symbiote and hearing what it just said, Mark finally confirmed its origin. Yes, he was the protagonist from Venom. A true anti-hero. But this directly indicated another issue, it wasn't just those two worlds connected to this universe. 
Perhaps there were even more parallel universe visitors roaming around in this world. Kid, I admire you. Want to play with me? Venom's head pulled out a strand from Eddie Brock's body and pressed its entire face against the magical barrier, looking at Mark. Full of fangs, and it had a crimson, oversized tongue. Oddly enough, it had a somewhat ugly cool appearance. Mark shook his head. Too bad, I'm not interested in you, and I don't want another consciousness sharing everything with me. What a pity. Don't you want to gain tremendous power? I can make you very powerful. The Venom symbiote didn't want to give up. It sensed an extremely powerful aura from Mark's body. Although it got along very harmoniously with Eddie Brock, pursuing powerful genes was an instinct among the symbiotes. Only that way could they keep strengthening themselves. Eddie shouted, What? You want to go with him? You're not here for a girlfriend, you're here to steal him. Hey, hey, don't make it sound like a love triangle. I've already said, I'm not interested in him. Mark spoke up to stop this nonsense, otherwise, his reputation would be ruined in a flash. What is he? Why does he look so, strange? Spider Tom and the others arrived at the scene. This question came from Ned. Symbiote Venom, Mark explained. He's very dangerous. Don't come into contact with him, he'll eat your brain. What? Ned stepped back in fear. That's terrifying. Degree, degree, degree.